Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 32 with Tim Bradbury. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. Uh, today we've got a fantastic guest, uh, Tim Bradbury, who's a coach educator for US Soccer. Uh, he also uh, runs an OD- ODP program in East New York and, and several other uh, coaching positions as well. But uh, I've referred to Tim many times in the podcast that I've done about my career. He's definitely one of the, the biggest influences on, on my coaching journey. Uh, I started my coaching journey in, in New York in 2002, spent two years out there and coach uh, Tim was um, head of coaching at the company I worked with and and he really did have a real in, in, um, powerful impact on my coaching philosophy and the way I work thinking about the sort of stuff he was doing back then that's in 2002 you know he really was ahead of the curve always has been a uh, really intelligent guy really eloquent guy speaks, speaks really well about the game really knowledgeable about all parts of the game particularly about player development particularly about the youngest players uh, and how to, to get the best out of them and uh, get real good quality uh, technical tactical outcomes in your session. So this one's a really good one. I really uh, really um, do do uh, encourage you to, to get the most out of this one. Tim will also be presenting at the United Soccer Coaches Convention in Chicago in January. Uh, proud to announce that my personal football coach will also be there. We're going to have a stall there, uh, sharing our work there, particularly the club partnerships. So remember, we're working with clubs like Wolfhampton Wanderers and the LA Galaxy. Also, we're working with grassroots clubs around the world with the club partnerships. So if you're interested in taking your club uh, to the next level, getting all your players on the app, you can drop me an email or just come and see us in uh, in Chicago, just drop me a message and I'll be happy to meet you. Just want to say also the feedback uh, on the, the the my personal football coach level one uh, ball mastery and one v one our elite soccer uh, e learning course has been phenomenal. So thanks very much. Uh, lots of people engaging in that. Uh, we've had uh, loads of people yeah, getting it. Also lots of clubs actually getting it for their coaches, understanding the importance to upskill their coaches. Uh, remember this is an e learning course available on the app you can work offline it gives you an understanding and effectiveness of how to use 1v1 ball mastery and small sided games in your session not only x's and o's but also um, the soft skills as well about how to structure your sessions how to get those good quality technical outcomes how to give players working how to keep them interested at all times which is really important when to use a pose work when not to use a pose work so that 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 level one course is going really well really really proud there that so many people are buying into it and, and uh, deciding to upskill themselves and improve their development, take their coaching game to the next level. So all going well, lots of stuff happening with the app. Uh, we've got a few big announcements coming as well. We've got some new, some new stuff coming out on the app, which I'm really, really excited about, uh, which I'm going to hopefully bring to you in the next few weeks. Uh, but remember, if you're going to be in Chicago, drop me a line. I want to try and connect with as many people as possible. And without further ado, let's get into the show. So, Tim Bradbury, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Can you just give us a, a brief outline of your playing and coaching experience up to this date, please? It's a fairly long history, but I started in Stoke and was an apprentice at Port Vale and then was told I was too slow to play at a high level. Fairly devastating news, played through the county Went to do a teaching degree in London, played for British colleges for four years, then played semi-pro for Hounslow in the Beza Homes League. Uh, came to New York and played semi-pro for Glen Cove. Throughout all those playing years, was always coaching. Coached from 17 years of age uh, for the youth team that I played for as so a sort of player coach. self appointed coached at college while I did my teaching degree for the FA, did some work with Tom Tranter and Charlie Hughes, and I was offered a job in America to work on a soccer camp since that point, coached for the last 28 years in America through a whole variety of courses, organisations, private soccer companies, 
that's it. So, so what what do you do at the moment then? What's your what's your main gig, if you like? I've got three gigs. <laughs> as, as, as everyone does in the coaching world, right? Always trying to make ends meet, aren't we? Unfortunately, yeah. but I uh, I'm director of coaching for Eastern New York. I work for U.S. soccer in a variety of ways. United coaches, national staff, U.S. youth. I was presenter of their national youth license. I'm also the coaching development officer for a club called Sousa. It's a private club based on Long Island and still training a few of my own teams. Well, so you're a busy guy. 17 hours a day normally. Yeah, sounds about right. That's good. So um, it's good. just get a little bit about your coaching philosophy. Coaching philosophy is very holistic in that the game is really a vehicle to forge good people, people that care, people that are honest, people that are sincere, people that are resilient, people that recognize challenge, care about others first. And like most teachers, soccer is the best vehicle for me to teach those characteristics and core values. And tell us a little bit about, you know, practically. I mean, look, remember my my first time working with you. I was uh, literally, literally fresh off the boat, if you were, and a blank slate. And obviously, working within you as a coach educator, obviously, a lot of your philosophy at that time was based around ball mastery and one v one and developing those creative players. Uh, is that still your philosophy? And and where did that come from? Those those sorts of ideals. It's still the core philosophy in the fact that. To play any game, you need to master the fundamental skills of the game. And if you don't do that, any sport, tennis, rugby, anything, you don't enjoy playing the sport. So if we're going to get players to play for life, they need to master the fundamental techniques. The only way of doing that is through initially being master of the ball. Uh, First touch within soccer being the most crucial aspect, because unless you can put it in a space to create time to make a good decision... You get frustrated, the game makes no sense, and you don't play for life. So that philosophy, I believe, should underpin anyone's approach who believes that we're trying to get people to play for life and that sport for life should be our first agenda. A byproduct of sport for life and that approach is obviously excellence. I mean, but where did that? I mean, where did where did that come from, though? I mean, I you know we're talking about here, uh, two thousand and two. I arrived in Long Island. Uh, you know, as you're obviously you, you've very much been in that 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 um, that technical tactical flow for a long time. Where did this? Where did you know? Because obviously it's very different. You know, complete completely contrast to how the English do things in the FA and how the Americans are doing things in their in their uh, education things. So where did these ideas come from? From my own failed experience and frustrations as a player, I guess I was smart enough to realise that I really loved to play and was cognizant of the fact that some of my lack of ability could only be made up for by spending a huge amount of time with the ball. I had certainly a severe lack of pace and compensated somewhat to play at a fairly high level and get paid quite well to play by being quite technical. Uh, I love spending time with the ball. Thankfully, I was of the age where there was no Nintendo. We had a few TVs, but it was always go out and play in the straights with your mates. Uh, And again, in that environment, the only way I could gain respect to my mates was by being able to do things with a ball. So thinking about, you know, the the current modern climate, I mean, I mean, street football is almost dead, isn't it? You don't get that much anymore. So, do you, I mean, uh, is, do you try and replicate the outcomes in a more structured environment? It's funny because working for US Soccer, I was part of the pilot group who designed the play practice play. i still heavily involved with the educational group who guide that coaching license group and coaching educators. And throughout all the courses or throughout all the coaching I've done, street soccer or a substitute for street soccer and free play has always been a fundamental piece so we're trying to 
trying to do several things over here. We're trying to define at the moment where street soccer got lost and kids' ability to play in the street went. Culturally, if we can create a tipping point to change that. And in the meantime, we're trying to substitute huge amounts of street soccer through either play practice, play approaches, or through fundamental nights on fields within clubs where it's players only. So here's the balls, here's the cones, go play. You can decide the numbers, you can decide the environment. So is that play practice, play like whole part whole type thing? No, it's much more defined than all part whole. All part whole is a coaching method which can involve, if you like, an 11 v 11, break it down back to 11 v 11. Play practice play is a very specific prescription that involves two aside, three aside, four aside, uh, for the novice coaches, they get guided questions after so long. The first play is really unadulterated kids, kids being creative with a few suggestions, some core activities in the middle that is very reality-based. So it's still a slice of the game. It's still uh, 5v4 to two counter-attacking goals, a piece like that. And then the final play is as close to the game that they will play that we can get. And so where does the, the uh, individual ball mastery come in? Individual ball mastery comes in, for me, in the play practice play model where you try and, through a love for the game that play practice play inspires, it's this homework piece where you say to each kid, either we're tracking your juggling or we want you to go and do this move at home or we practice doing this against the wall. So it's builds obviously to a huge degree with a lot of the things that you do and that we're trying to inspire our kids because they get to play and because what they most value is fun to go away and spend some time on their own with the ball with some guidance through either online or through coaching uh, for a whole series of activities they can do so then so you're saying that the whole ideal session there is completely opposed and game like practices I think there's, it's funny because in teaching so many courses, you talk increasingly about methods of coaching. Methods of coaching being progressive, play, practice, play, shadow play, phase play, small sided games, functional play, coaching within the game. The whole methods that most coaches are aware of. And the truth of great coaching is balance. Balance with player centered, balance with Q&A, balance with some command. But also balance with the methods because I'm still a huge believer within America that we have to give our kids progressive practices that begin with a ball each. They're still player centered, it's still fun and activities, never drills, no laps, lines, lectures is a formula we could all do well to adhere to. But certainly a ball each and a progressive practice to balance out a play practice play approach and we will give the young children, the ball mastery that we seek. Do you think that's the problem though, isn't it? It's this, um, it's this modern, you know, debate we're having within the coaching circles is about, you know, we want more game like practices, which I agree with, but then what seems to have happened is that people have seemed to have gone too far the other way and now resist getting any, you know, individual ball work players, you know, because it's inverted commas unopposed and not realistic. And maybe we're losing that little bit of technical, quality or that you know that important individual time with the ball because people maybe have misunderstood where the research is supposed to take us I think it's intriguing as a educational debate and that people took player centered guided discovery players being able to think somehow equated to you can't do that when a player has a ball each and I've designed thousands of activities which you've seen as a Naga coach and taught thousands of Brits that there's a whole set of ball each practices that are fun, are engaging, have problem solving, uh, and obviously at key cognitive stages of development, kids value it most because they've got a ball each. And if you tie all this in with the cognitive psychosocial uh, development piece, there's a stage where they obviously need a ball each and it's what they most value. And I think there's also, you know, we've heard people talk about perception, action, coupling, and, 
you know, for me, you know, you still get perception action coupling when I'm working individually with the ball, whether I'm doing a juggles or, you know, I'm practicing my turns or how I, re- you know, react on my left foot, my ball striking. You still, you know, at those, especially at the early stages of development, you know, understanding how the ball reacts in different ways to my body and it approaches me and stuff like that. What's, what's your thoughts on that? I tend to agree. If you look at all the science, myelinization, perception action, coupling, uh, peak, make it stick, the whole body of literature that's out there on how we learn best, then I think you can do that with a ball each. You can make it game-like. You can do the ball player ratios and put them in environments which are typically ball-centered but have the necessary slices of the game language that make it fun and cater for both it's interesting tim because obviously you have a background in teaching as well like myself and you know obviously you know i was uh reading a lot of doug lamoff's work at the moment and uh, he talks about that you know i mean to build in layers and do you think that's because it's interesting a lot of the debates become you know almost a lot of people in the sports science realm who maybe don't have the teaching experience especially young children don't seem to understand that or have a different approach because maybe from their diff- they're from a different field or maybe because they're not educationalists what's your, what's your thoughts on that i think unfortunately that people get trapped in the camp they're in so the educationalists and scientists and research people some interesting work on fun maps that you may have read they get trapped into one corner and coaches or coaches who are more built in the street more you know became a coach because we played and we get trapped in camps and we get trapped in sides of the fence that we probably shouldn't. Leemoff is somebody, Doug, I'm working closely with. We've just written an article about the use of the freeze tool and I'm helping read some of Doug's new book and he is a, combines the two. He's a practically minded chap because his son plays soccer so he's got the soccer experience but obviously also has the vast knowledge based around good educational research if we combine the two well we'd all be much much better off but I suppose that's the argument isn't it you, you get some people in the, at the extremities as you do obviously at, in Twitter with you know one extreme the other saying you know maybe that is, is something that shouldn't be taught that I, you know someone said the other day on a blog that oh if you look at children they learn to walk by themselves they should learn to play football by themselves but some you know ridiculous notions like that you know, but you know, it's 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 a it's a, it's a they're maybe saying that it shouldn't be taught that you know football's you know it's a complete creative and individual sort of thing should be more spontaneous. Absolutely, and I, I think I'm increasingly aware because I've been access to some wonderful people: Anson Dorrance, Nico Remain, Barry Powell, who were both head of the KMVB and head of the Belgium FA. Uh, all sets of people who are just real experts in the game if we look at their CVs and then you can add Liam off and people that I've worked with and you become aware that if we're going to create this recipe of what great coaching is through the developmental stages you've always got to be open minded you've always got to be willing to listen, filter I think the educational research to some degree is beyond debate so if you look at myelinization and how the signals transfer quicker if there's some problem solving and all that piece. Yeah, I think there's pieces that we can't ignore. There's also pieces because kids are all different that we have to just cater for differently. It's interesting looking at Rusty Earnshaw's work and the cards people, which I'm sure you're aware of. There's just so many pieces to get it right that I firmly believe that we'll all continue to learn till the day we drop. And what about, obviously, I remember... Uh, rondos were, were a big part of your philosophy when we, we used to do a lot of our staff training what, what's your thoughts on that obviously they're not there's a lot of debate in America particularly about the effectiveness of the use of rondos in sessions I have to be sincere because I've been telling everyone that whoever uses the word rondo should be sent to an orchestra <laughs> because the word rondo actually refers to some climax in a musical piece and I think it's a little bit of the bravado so a possession work let's deal with that piece 4v2 3v1 
where players are making decisions, first touch is important, movement without the ball, I firmly believe should be built into any progressive curriculum. And I don't think we should teach everything to the game. So I believe that you should have a developmental piece throughout as you're working with players. And as you go through that developmental piece, initially it's a ball each, then it's two player combinations and a ball between two. But as the age of nine, seven, eight, nine, when they can understand space and make decisions, then you start to teach possession. And that begins with 4v1, which has got little movement through 3v1, 4v2, 7v4, possession with direction. So I think it's got a firm place within teaching the game. And I mean, but I mean, what's, what is the official um, position of US soccer in that and the, the, where their coaching course is? US soccer, because of the debates and discussions, it's all based on this reality piece that everything peeled away should look like a slice of the game so if you take everything away it should all whether it be 1v1 to goal 2v1 to goal 3v2 to goal whatever numerical piece that you can think of that for the most part reality reality based training is one of the three tenants for US soccer reality experiential and holistic interesting so they, they tend to and it's been debated within uh, the courses and certainly it's a continuing debate within the educational group that are acting in the background but so then where does like ball mastery fit into that then you know in the working well, individually with the ball in an unopposed environment piece would become the closest thing to ball mastery theoretically would be 1v1 yeah interesting and uh, so th thinking about now as you as an, a coach educator, I mean you're you know like I often cite you as being very inspiring uh, in my my uh, development. What's your uh, you know what's what are the main things about educating young coaches? It's part of the process because if your aim is to change the world, and I know that's very little house on the prairie for the people who can relate then you have to find a way to impact as many players as possible. And if you live in the shoes I live in and you travel around and you see field after field, kid after kid who's getting a bit of a raw deal, really. They're not getting to see the full beauty of the game. They're not getting to enjoy the process. And you can quickly get to the stage where the only way to impact it is to educate as many or communicate with as many, perhaps educates a little bit of the wrong word, collaborate with as many coaches as possible. But what you do is try and put yourself in as many coaching positions as you can where you can influence as many coaches as possible. I've either been very skillful or very lucky in that through the Naga piece with the thousands of Brits, it's upwards of 10,000 coaches that I've managed to interact with which is a fairly huge number and thankfully not just yourself but a huge number of those are enormously successful within the realm that they've chosen to go into so, so I mean give us some of those key things that those are uh, key points for young coaches thinking about their sessions and their delivery open minded always plan meticulously be able to observe watch kids are not empty vessels they've all got some experience be aware of how to appeal to each kid use the game the game's got the answers so look at the game keep it real to the game make things as real as possible and make it fun first and foremost they've got to enjoy your interaction with them and they've got to enjoy the learning process I think my main takeaway is obviously apart from all the the brilliant tactical technical stuff where in terms were you know your your famous tagline was you know if you haven't got a personality make one up and that really important with working with young players you know having a big personality that delivery almost is is more important even than what the the content is 
especially with the younger ones, trying to captivate them, keep them, like you say, enchanted, keep them interested. And that, that was really powerful for me, even when I went on to do my teacher training and delivering my, 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 my classes, thinking about that, keeping kids interested in the tempo of your session, you know, and, and being in that personality. I mean, what, how, how important is that? And, you know, how do you, how do you support coaches sure. in developing that? And somehow, because we've gone so far down the other pieces of research, that that personality of a coach that you talk about is as true as ever. You've got to, your voice is a tool. You've got to be an actor. You never get upset. Maybe you all do, but you have to be able to act upset. You have to be able to smile when perhaps you want to cry. So you've got the delivery part with the voice. You've got the charisma part with the body language. You've got the entertain a part with the smiles and I think the best coaches at any age bring all those pieces together without even thinking about it they do that in the organization naturally within the background so sessions flow people cones are moved somehow magically and the personality is suitable for any point in time with any age and the very best ones can do it with the five-year-olds through the 30-year-olds. So, some, you're, I mean, you talked, we, we, we were speaking earlier before you came on, you're going to deliver a C license. I mean, what sort of stuff are you delivering on a C license? Is that is, is it more about, you know, your approach and the delivery and the organisation? It all ties in. On the C license, we're teaching a progressive approach, which is something based on orientation, learning, implementation. So it's a four-stage practice, one stage where you show the problem, but within all those stages, every coach that I work with gets the same embroidery behind the scenes. So we always talk about the voice. We always talk about the teaching position. We always talk about the tone of the voice, uh, whether it was appropriate to use a question, whether that moment in time perhaps could have been a bit of command, whether the moment they chose was better for an individual reference. Uh, Perhaps some coaching in the flow, which is specificity of specificity of knowledge is a problem that uh, I find on many licenses that I'm teaching, and that people throw out good or unlucky as a coaching phrase. And often I ask them how the kid got a cold at that moment in time and how they knew. Because unlucky is not coaching. Yeah, that was always one of my my uh, bad coaching mannerisms, saying unlucky over and over, which I, I didn't. Uh realise until I filmed myself coaching. But I mean, it's, uh, how, how important is that when you yeah, film no, I didn't coaches? remember what I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I was going to say, yeah, unlucky, but I won't. But yeah, so I mean, do you still, how important is that video in coaches and part of coaching development? Does that still, is that a big part of it? US soccer do brilliant with that piece because we video, that's a religion. It's built into the sea. Within the D license, it's still an option that they video. Every coach that I, so within SUSE, every coach that I'm in charge of developing, we video at least twice a year. I look at it, they look at it. So we, the self-reflection is for any motivated coach is important. But when you timestamp a video and you timestamp A, the comment made, so it's all factual, and you can talk to them about, look at the reaction of the kid at that moment in time, how effective do you think that piece of command was? Uh, it should just be built into any coach's fabric who believes in doing this at the high level. And so t talking about, I just want to get in a little bit to the nitty gritty about, you know, uh, young, you know, young players. Just can you talk to us a little bit about that, the, 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 the most appropriate football for each age group in terms of how it progresses from the very youngest until the older players in terms of what they should be doing, what it should look like, the session should look like? Absolutely. So let's begin with the fundamental piece, which is the cognitive development, the psychosocial and the physical development. So if you understand the kid, you can understand the soccer that fits their development. So if you look at a five-year-old, egocentric, not really in charge of the body, they basically need a ball each. So if you think five and six is a time for a ball each, there's only certain soccer actions that fit with a ball each which is a lot of dribbling, a lot of moves, a lot of individual creativity, using the ball to hit targets, 
then if you go to seven and eight where they can begin to solve the problem in pairs you quickly work into ball each is always consistently there because you need that ball mastery piece as the fundamental development then you've got two player combinations once you've got two player combinations for me receiving and first touch is the crucial skill and I'll shout out to first touch which is if you're not teaching three types of first touch a first touch that prepares it into a space where you disguise what you're doing a first touch that beats immediate pressure and a first touch that protects it then for me you're not really teaching first touch at all because we can't just randomly say we want players to receive the ball so seven and eight you've got passing with different surfaces you've got a lot of first touch work you've got two player combinations nine ten and eleven you're into all that came before ball each two player combinations uh, passing receiving but now you're in possession world so you're starting to build in movement without the ball as you get bigger that leads into longer passing driven passes lofted passes it's worth noting that I'm always talking about the attacking side of the ball because fundamentally I think you teach creativity first so that really is the rhythm if you want to think of a rhythm of teaching the game with the tactical piece broken down that would be my suggestion on a good rhythm to do that and so what age would you start teaching those those different types of first touch as soon as they can be even with the little five-year-olds because eventually the language you use is past yourself but eventually with a five-year-old game so they're playing 4v4 some little kid ends up in a space and the kid comes through them by accident we've got two things to do at that time either say to the kid can you play a little pass to yourself or you just leave the kid at their own free will and they'll probably either whack it or dribble with it so I think the language begins at that age with this little pass to yourself piece but as a fundamental piece with focus it's seven and eight for me if a kid leaves me by eight and can't receive a ball with three different ways, then I, I believe I've failed that kid. So you'd like to play 4v4 or under five? The rhythm we're using, the PDIs. Because um, I remember you leave, used to be a 3v3 man back in the day, if I remember, if I remember yeah, correctly. I'll leave, I'll leave uh, under five with the comment that I believe that kids at that age should really be playing one with one programs that they should be going with a mum or a dad and if a club was doing it well it would be kid comes with mum or dad there's some master coach leading a series of ball centered activities and the only other person they really interact with is the adult that brought them big brother big sister uh, so my personal beliefs and those of I can understand why US soccer with the PDIs went 4v4 7v7 9v9 and 11v11 because we're an enormous country where all over the country, I mean, there's people still playing 11 a side with five-year-olds. Wow. So there was a lot to fix. And, um, well, moving nicely along then into American soccer and thinking about a lot to, f a lot to fix. I mean, uh, you know, just this, uh, this has been recorded a day after the England-USA um, game, 3-0 to England, players like Jaden Sancho. Why why does America struggle to produce players can you know in the you know with in respect to the fact that they've got so many people playing soccer in that country in your country Not enough people putting development first would be my first discussion point in your when you're within a culture where win at all costs is always the case and perhaps a little bit guilty of picking the biggest strongest kids because it's such a well-developed country. Uh, not many kids go hungry over here. And the kids that are going hungry typically don't play soccer, which is another discussion. But if you take those kids and you put them in college soccer, which really nobody teaches anything in college soccer, it's all win at all costs. It's fairly vertical. Obviously, within MLS, there's a huge debate about the lack of... Well, the league's young, I would say... That is part of the issue, but in creating quality of the league and 
uh, promotion, relegation, and coming up with a formal system within that. So I think there's a whole variety of PCs that is preventing America producing thousands of high-level players. Well, you, only, you only need 11, don't you? <laughs> you only a couple. Got Pulisic, but don't seem to have that many others coming through. No, well, I, I, in, in fairness, in fairness, Tim... At the base. In fairness, in fairness, Tim, I've, I've always seen like the American youth teams actually actually seem to always do really well. The ones I've seen them in England play. So why do you think there's maybe? I mean, my my my, you know, looking from the outside when I was there, was thinking about like you said, you mentioned the college program. I've I've coached some college boys over here. They say there's uh, obviously they play that really you know condensed season only for, um, for over a few months, and apparently there's uh, some sort of you know. NSCAA rule where they can only cope spend so much train time training with the ball in the season or something like that and then that's why they spend so much time in the gym have you heard that there's only there's formal rules about when they can get together as a team so they're only allowed to train that's a, a, a truth and there's very tight rules I know there's been a movement within college coaches to try and get it to year round I certainly think the short season I mean, with what we know about periodization, we're back to science, aren't we? The periodization science is so strong to create a short season where players play seven days a week, don't get to rest, play three games. It's just asinine. And really, you want a group of people controlling that who are believe in the game and want to grow the game. And part of their agenda is, can we create a, a team that can challenge for the World Cup? And that synergy within college soccer, uh, the DA program, the MLS league, it's, the synergy isn't just not there. So what, what's, what is the way forward then? If you gave me a magic wand and that asked me to, you're asking people to take away a lot of things where people sometimes make a lot of money, uh, where colleges are trapped into rules that are really designed to govern other games and the way other games are played. You really need somebody to say, let's just place in all these positions soccer purists who first agenda is we love the game, we think the game's a great vehicle for holistic development, therefore within each environment what can we do together to create an environment which which will produce those players and the high school season is the same if you look at the high school I've written so many things about the high school soccer season within America there's a number of high school soccers who want me buried it's not that I'm anti high school I recognize the the wonderful social piece but again to play seven days a week for two hours with three games if you do that you should really be in jail And so how long does their season last? Is that the same? Is it like a three or four, three or four months? Yes. Thing? Interesting. So what about I mean in terms of you know this progression since I was out there? You know we've got we've got a lot more academies, pro club academies, and development academies. What's that landscape like in terms of has that enhanced player development? No, well, to a huge degree, unfortunately, the many different leagues and the cultural piece that went alongside that so the cultural piece was everybody wants the bumper sticker my kid is elite well, it was elite then it, first it was premier then it was elite next it'll be super elite so as long as the parents can get the bumper sticker they'll go and play at what they consider to be a high level so all the best kids got split between u.s youth leagues u.s club leagues uh da programs so for me, our best players, because of some of the high school rules and because of some of the economies and the monies that people have to spend, our best players are split over a whole variety of leagues. And those people interested in the elite pyramid quickly get to the place where we need our better players to at some point play and compete together. But what about the actual the pro club academy environment? That's... that's uh... No, they're not paid for play anymore. That, that's right, isn't it? That's really improved it recently. The MLS clubs are all fully funded. So the MLS DAs are fully funded. Still at the stage because of the coaching development piece and the coaches that work within DA are still getting 
suitably qualified to coach the DA programs. So you've got the coaching development piece, but certainly with the rules within the DA in terms of the periodization, I'm of a believer that they got that piece right. They protect the training game ratio. They do a good job of that. So if you get a high level coach within that environment and you can reach out to all the kids within the communities that possibly could be playing and open those doors, then you start to create a recipe which should be great for high-level development. Interesting. Philadelphia Union, I've got some friends who work there. They've just created their own school. Where's that, uh, Philadelphia Union? Yeah, they've got a school for their DA players, so they've now created a brilliant environment which ties in the education, they have access to the players. I'm hoping that more DAs will copy that model. Uh, so do you think the bright is generally future? Is the future bright then in US soccer? I meet certain coaches. I taught a coaching instructor license last week where the coaches I met had such a desire, strong desire to grow the game and do the right thing by kids. Were fully aware of the pressure to win. So at some point I'm highly optimistic, but also... I'm astute enough when I go out on the streets and travel and see enormous number of kids placed in environments. The rule of thumb for me is if I wouldn't have my own kid involved, I don't think any kid should have to suffer through it. And I see too many environments where I wouldn't let my kid be involved, unfortunately. So in terms of what, just the way, the, the philosophy of what they, how they're coached or, you know, what in, in terms of what? Kids don't need to be berated. They don't need to learn in fear. This win at all costs costing affects obviously style of play because you don't play out the back because you might concede a goal. Uh, it affects even something as simple as shape within 4v4 where we have a classic situation where every professional coach in the world tells the kid to go play in a diamond. So the little kid at the bottom of the diamond close to their own goal, when they have the ball, that little kid never goes forward because he's close to his own goal. So... Coaches preventing development is, is an issue for me. Whereas you say to a group of kids, when we've got the ball, let's all go and attack. Interesting. Into the game. And then they figure out their own shape. And what about yourself, Tim? I mean, what do you do in terms of your own professional development? How do you continue to stay sharp and, and on the ball? I'm pleased to say I've been going through a bit of a rebirth. I think I got to a stage being completely honest and humble about it where I thought that I'd uh, invented the cake because I was on all these national staffs I was part of these study groups I got to a stage where people wanted to listen to my opinion and I, I think went through a stage where I thought well my opinion must be good then I I've got a friend Ian Mulner in Massachusetts who probably would be worth you talking to he's a great guy with vast experience but we share some books and research, and I was recommended some books, which were both presenting books and educate. Then I got into podcasts. I've listened to some brilliant podcasts over the last month, and combining that with an instructor group that I was involved with in when we were looking at adult-centered learning, I've just been through an epiphany in the fully aware more than ever that. I'll die learning about the game and how to teach it. And what about, I mean, obviously you're working for US Soccer. What, do, they, do they have some sort of development program in place? Very good with the coaching development program. Very good in the respect that we're developing a whole set of instructor licenses that will begin with a base course so that people learn the culture within US soccer that's evolved no end and then specific knowledge for each license group that you'll teach. Whereas most countries I still believe get to the stage where if you get the highest license and somebody identifies you as being fairly good, all of a sudden you're teaching the next license. That's never made any sense to me. I don't just suddenly, um, I was lucky enough through some of my performances on different licenses and diplomas to be told, oh, you can, you can go and teach. 
Well, I may have had the teaching skills, but there was certainly a lot more involved in adult education that I needed to learn. And I think this is perhaps where America is at the foreground of coaching development. So in what way? In the way that there's a recognition that instructors, great instructors, need to be built and developed, and it's an ongoing process. So bring them in, do coaching development, teach them how to self-reflect, give them the new science as the new science comes about, make them aware that it needs to be continual growth and make them responsible for that growth. And I mean, so what's the, I mean, so in, in terms of like the, the, the philosophy of the way they're trying to get, you know, teams to play, we've got, we've had the English DNA here. What's the US version? It's interesting to me that you say we have the English DNA. Well, we've been given the English DNA. I don't say we necessarily have it, but the new English DNA, which has been published by the FA, so they've they've recently created a new framework of the sort of players they want to produce and the way they want them to play. So, what's what was the 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 uh, US version? The US version, I think, is evolving. It was, I mean, to put a formal piece on it, it was possession out to the back. It was formed out of four three three, which was really became. And we should teach moments of the game rather than formations. So if you can build with three, build with three. Get numbers up in midfield so that you can either switch the point of attack or create two-player combinations. Three formed high uh, so that you can be direct at moments in time. So it was possession-based when mentioned. But increasingly, I think the MLS clubs through the DAs are each forming their own approach. I know through access to the Red Bulls and some of what they're doing, part of what the Red Bulls are about is, it's almost like Sweden, let's be better without the ball and let's dictate where the other team can have the ball and when we win it, get to goal quickly. Well, that's what the the, uh, the Red Bull Academy are doing? Yes. Wow. And I'm not a... Uh, I'm certainly hugely loyal to the organisations that I teach and coach for, and I should be. When I put my US soccer hat on, I'm tattooed red, white, and blue. I've certainly got a personal belief on the beauty of the game and how the game should be played. And it's back to player development. Players don't develop if they don't touch the ball. To touch the ball at certain ages, they have to initially pass short and learn to possess it. So if you believe in player development, for me, you're trapped in a possession-based approach. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean same, similar here. I mean, it, you talk about the English DNA here, but I mean, you know, really, as Richard Allen talked about in the previous podcast, you know, he worked at the FAs, like, you know, a lot of that work, really, the success came from all the academies and the investment they put in. And, you know, but there's such a remarkable contrast in the way academies are doing things. The philosophies are, you know, you look at London, you know, for instance, really different around the clubs there. So it's interesting to hear that in America as well. I assume, you know, for instance, we're obviously we're working with LA Galaxy and stuff like that as part of the pro homework program, My Personal Football Coach. But maybe do you think like this because of the different cultural influences that's different around the country there? It's either one of the great things about America or one of the tragedies, as you allude to, the different cultures are enormous. I mean, it's just a melting pot and you've got different people leading different DAs, whether it be Claudio with NYC. I mean, huge amount of... And people believe in those powerful personalities which I guess is human nature and they're allowed to dictate an approach I sometimes wish they'd have more conversations with educational developers and people like perhaps you and I because I think that they need to be reminded of what real player development perhaps should look like from bottom up well I think that's what we mentioned earlier you know it's just uh, you know for me it's a uh... You know, when you're, you're talking about developing 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and you know, or five or six or seven or eight and nine-year-olds, even at the beginning, you know, from a nine-year-old is very different to an 11-year-old in terms of their development, and an eight-year-old. And I think that's where we sometimes fall short a little bit. Is that you know, it's a one one hat fits all policy, or someone who's very you know experienced, played the game, or you know, but never actually interacted or worked with young players consistently. I think that's that might be an issue. I think the key thing, what you just said about 9 and 11 year olds is nobody learns when fear is the, the instigating tool. 
So you put me in a game at nine and you teach me if I make a mistake, life's over because we lost the game. And you sit me in the car and then I get butchered. I quickly fall out of love with the experience. And that's whether you're nine, 11. I played semi-pro where people did the same thing to me. Got sent off. Got sent off because one spat in my pay face playing for Beezer Hounslow. The assistant coach chased me around the changing room. I was scared. <laughs> Not surprised. But fear. As people stop ex, uh, expressing themselves. Creativity goes. I think if we were to fix one thing, that would be the first thing we should fix. We got to get to a game situation where players are really allowed to express themselves, make decisions without somebody joysticking them and using fear because they think that the next win is around the corner. Winning, the place of winning, we always play to win. Everyone plays to win. Okay, that's done and dusted. Now let's get a development where it needs to be. When does that become more important than you think winning though? When do you make that transition between, you know, development, fun and winning? I think mean, they always win. They always try and win. So that for me is uh, a constant. The, when you can begin to put winning before everything else, for me, is when all the skills of the game are understood and performed. So if I can, if I'm a 17-year-old kid and I can receive it on the ground, receive it in the air, dribble to penetrate, dribble to protect, the whole set of things that we'd want a great 17-year-old to do, then for me it's okay because at that point... I've reached the level of play where I want to win. I want to prove I'm better than you. I want to put my skills against skill set against yours and say, Luke, I'm, I can be dominant. And once that point of development is passed, for me it's okay to say, okay, I'm going to help you be dominant. And the way we judge it is if we win. Yeah, I was, I was lucky enough to spend some time with Mark Hughes recently. He's at Southampton. And... Um... He was saying, I was just asking him about that, about his balance, you know, I, you know, I said, how much you know, individual work do you really do? And he just says, you know, that, and I was alluding to the fact, you know, does at that level, is it more just about, you know, getting the team out and getting a result? And I think that's probably when, you know, when only at the very highest level, you know, when actually they're, they're the only, they're the only points that actually, they're the only wins that actually matter when, you know, when there's, you know, people's jobs on the line and they're trying to win the league. I coached Crystal Dawn, as you know, and Crystal went through a developmental stage where she was just, an incredible learner, desire beyond belief, but she also got to a stage when she was about 17, 18, just as she was going off to North Carolina and Anson, where the kid wanted to win. <laughs> she was driven. Yeah, but I think, I mean, like I said, I think you get those, they, people have those intrinsic, natural intrinsic mechanisms anyway, don't you? They, those are real elite players. I, I talk a little bit about that elite mentality when I'm working, in, I mean, I work, luckily I work with a lot of pros, some of the best young players in the world, and they all have that, you know, unquenchable desire to win, to get better. And, you know, and even when we're doing little practices, they, you know, they want to get it right. You know, if it doesn't work out, they want to do it again. They won't finish on a bad one. You know, those elite players, ones, you know, we, when we're lucky enough to work with those sorts of players, we recognise those, those, uh, those, those, those similar, similar traits that they have. Do you think that you can coach that or teach that into a young player? Or do you think that's a natural natural part of somebody I think you can breed it I think if your environment is suitable at specific developmental stages you can breed those personalities I think it's a, obviously a very refined skill but if you get the enjoyment right you get the level of competition and the level of challenge right and you get the flow right and you immerse them in the game and they start to love the game I think that environment tends to breed more of the type of play you just described than any other. I think also, I remember you, something you used to talk about when we used, we used to talk about, you know, uh, dynamic warm-ups. And, you know, you're saying that youngest players don't necessarily have to do them, but it's about getting their good habits in early. And I'm, that's why, I'm, you know, you, you mentioned homework early. That's why I think it's so important, you know, getting those habits of, you know, the players who go away and work away from the game, you know, work on their individual skills. You have that... You know, try and develop that intrinsic mechanism to want to go right, and get better at my passing or my ball striking or my one v one or that sort of thing. Just you know, so how, how important do you think that is with with young players? Absolutely essential, and it's a little bit. You read that as a coach because you know if you've got it right. If all of a sudden 
all your kids are at practice 10 minutes early kicking against the wall or they all come to you and say, look, I was juggling last night, I got my new PB. You've inspired the intrinsic piece and that's when things start to take off. You know they're willing to go and do it on your own. You know that's born out of a love because you haven't used fear to generate that. Uh, things gather pace quickly at that point. So for any coach out there reading that point and being honest about have I achieved this? Do any of my kids go and spend time on the book? And I don't mean because mum and dad are in, in the garden with a shotgun. Hmm. It's because the kid generally has a desire to go and do it. And and, and again, back to yourself, uh, Tim, any sort of really important in, uh, mentors or inspirations in, on your journey that you'd, that you'd you know, really stick out? I think you'd have to reference two different groups of people uh, about a thousand young coaches that I've stolen from that I've been lucky enough to work with, teach and with everyone you do that you either get a good idea of something that I definitely shouldn't do or a good idea uh, and if you look at your cohort within the Naga group and people that you still know I've got thousands of Brits uh, Tessa Payne who probably is still involved with the FA uh, I think she's now she's a Arsenal head of the girls academy at Arsenal Tessa I think so there's a lot of people like that that I've stolen from but I've also had formal mentors Anson Dorrance and I became fast friends and collaborated on a whole variety of things uh, Ian Mulner I spoke about uh, I've got people within US soccer Barry Powell's Nico Remain Zach Crawford so I've been very lucky that at key points in time I've had these people uh, that I could lean on how, how important do you think it is having to have a mentor I mean I've got you know people in the coaching world and obviously I've got some you know business people as well as, as a business owner how, how important is having a, a, a mentor in your development it's essential having a mentor that you have a and good mentors have this wonderfully honest and candid ability to give you feedback. It's obviously born out of respect because it's a relationship that's grown over time. And I think we all need that because at the point in, we all stumble, don't we? We all fall. Uh, human nature, we try not to. We have moments when we think we've arrived and we definitely haven't. And at that point, you need tweaking. Uh, so I'm increasingly aware that it's funny, I've got to a stage in an age where I think people consider me a mentor, so I mentor a lot of people, and it's made me more aware than ever that I still need, so I bounce ideas off key people a lot. So uh, also, Tim, so you're presenting at the uh, United Soccer Coach Convention this year. Just uh, tell us a little bit about what session you're going to put on so we can all look forward to that one. Yes, thank you very much. I've got two sessions. I'm doing a practical session on a rhythm for teaching back to pressure which is born out of the fact that I see professional players down in ability to make good decisions when their backs to goal uh, and it's a huge technical tactical piece because there's a probably of all the technical tactical pieces this is the one that's the biggest conundrum I think it's got the most problems in so I'm going to try and show people a way to teach that in a sort of fun activity based developmental way and then I've got a classroom session on leading the team which is one of the six tasks of a coach that we recognize within America on our pathway and I'm going to do some suggestions on best ways to get a team to manage themselves create their own goals uh, and take care of that process fantastic and and what, advi what what advice would you have then for a, a young aspiring coach who you know want to make their way, make a career in the game like you have? Point one: recognize all the things you need to be an expert in. So you can do that with just a pen and paper, put a player in the middle, an expert in communication, an expert in the knowledge of the game, nutrition, periodization, behavioural, uh, how people learn. That's point one. Point two, recognize it's going to be an experiential pathway. You're not going to be great in a day. You've got to be resilient. You've got to pick yourself up, 
dust yourself off. Point three, master self-reflection. Sit down, video yourself, reflect in the proper way when you've done a session, be prepared to rip it up. Point four, have a mentor. Have somebody who you can rely on to give you the honest feedback and the guidance, point you on the right way. Uh, I guess the final point is it. I firmly believe it takes the 10,000 hours plus 10,000 hours. We can debate forever, deliberate practice, 10,000 hours. Uh, I think it is a labour of love. I don't see anybody being great without all the work that goes in. And to be a great coach, first spend 10,000 hours becoming a great person who understands the game and then spend another 10,000 hours learning to, how to educate. And what about advice for a young player on starting on their journey? Be careful about the environment you put yourself within. You want someone who you know cares for the game and cares for you, that they'll put you as a, a person first and will allow you to express yourself with the ball at the appropriate times. And, uh, you know, just and one last thing, you know, obviously my personal football coach is all about ball mastery. Just tell us, all those the parents, the coaches, the players there, how important is it to go away and, and master that ball? Use my tennis career to illustrate this. I learned to play tennis in a school in England. There was two tennis rackets, teacher held one and 36 of us shared the other. <laughs> I hit the ball, I think, three times in four years. So I love tennis and can't play a lick which is sort of haunts me. Don't do that to the kids. They need to play this game for life and to fall in love with it. They have to be able to do things with the ball. The foundation of all that is ball mastery. All the skills, I prefer skill than techniques, applied skill based on a decision, but all the skills come from how comfortable I am with the ball. Fantastic. Tim, thanks for your time, mate. It's been fantastic. Thank you very much. It's been an honour. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's dynamic ball mastery program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.